The new Patriot Brother X2020 flashlight model is here. And with all the common threats nowadays to our freedom, the future of America is not promised and neither is your safety. One of the best things you can invest in for your home protection is a Patriot Brother flashlight. And why not purchase one of the best flashlights on the market? the Patriot Brother X2020 flashlight. The holidays are quickly approaching and that is why Patriot Flashlight wants to extend a special 20% Patriot discount to all customers throughout the month of December. Patriot Flashlight is the perfect gift for you and your loved ones this holiday season. Supply is limited and this is the very last chance to get 20% off the new 2020 model before they sell out. Take advantage now and give you and your family the gift of night protection. Please visit www.patriotflashlight.com. All right, good evening, everyone. You're listening to Red Pill 78. I am the Corruption Detector, and this is your Red Pill News. Joining me once again for a very special edition of the program is David Paulitis, author of the Missing 411 series. He's got a new book, Missing 411 Canada, and it details some really strange missing people reports from the Great White North. Dave, how are you? Hey, great. How are you doing? Excellent, excellent. Glad you're here. Uh, so just for anybody maybe watching that is not not familiar with your work or with the Missing 411 series, please give us a, a brief synopsis. What is Missing 411? So it started about eight or nine years ago. Some uh, park rangers came to me when I was doing some research at a park and told me about a series of missing persons cases that, in their jurisdiction that had them concerned. And they said somebody ought to look into it. And that was eight, nine years ago now, and that's how it got started. And uh, we started looking through missing person cases in the wilderness. And, you know, if you look at 50 cases, you really don't see much. But if you looked at five, six, seven, eight thousand of them, certain things start to fall out. And as I started to do the research, I had piles of cases in different areas of the living room. And they were all by what I called profile points. In a lot of the cases, the people weren't found at all. Other times they were found in areas that were previously searched. And that was odd. And then other times they'd bring canines to the area and the canines couldn't pick up a scent. They'd bring trackers into the area and the trackers couldn't find a scent. Sometimes there was a weather event in conjunction with the disappearance. And then after I got into it heavily, uh, I started to figure out, because I started to map these disappearances, that there were clusters of missing people in different areas. And I suppose the big thing in this book is I identified the second largest cluster of missing people in the world, which is the greater Vancouver area, which was a huge, huge surprise. But that falls into another profile point, which is water. And uh, victims found near water, around water. And the interesting thing about Vancouver is they have the Fraser River that runs through the middle and empties out, I think, seven or eight different major lakes that are like fingerlings that fall into the north. So it, it kind of continues. And as I've gone forward, uh, I've written articles or I've written stories in 11 different countries that fit these profile points. And in this book, I, I had written some stories about Canada in the past, and I thought I'd put some perseverance into it. And really what I got out of it was many of the disappearances in Canada mimic the disappearances in the States. But the topography and the regions that they went missing in were just completely odd compared to what we know in the United States. How so? How, how do they differ from what you see in the United States? Well, in the great north, uh, in the Northwest Territories, in Labrador and such, there's really no ground cover. I mean, you're talking about wide open areas in a lot of those areas. Yeah. And then, uh, in Alberta, you're talking about almost like a plains area where it's really flat. And British Columbia, I think, has some of the most wild area of anywhere in North America where they have, you know, tens of miles where there's nobody. And that really plays into some of the strange things that are seen and reported in the stories. Uh, and what are some of those strange things that are reported in the stories? So you have people that are that talk about having dreams you talk about lights in the sky. Um, you talk about the killings of, and, and deaths of people that go unexplained and they bring in experts and they can't really account for how the person died or what killed them. Uh, 
things along those lines. It's pretty odd. Yeah, it seemed to me what really set this book apart was the 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 spooky nature of some of these uh, disappearances, more so than what you see here uh, in the disappearances here in the United States. Um, now, when you're talking about the topography up there, so th this is this is like a great white tundra correct i mean like it's either snow or it's just a whole bunch of open land so really no place for people to just like disappear like they can't walk down a trail or you know find themselves on the on the side of a mountain in the same way that they could in the united states oh they definitely could no i, I don't mean to misrepresent that but let's just say in british columbia right around that vancouver area eh, the mountains are maybe four or five thousand feet high and I come from Colorado where the mountains are 14,000 feet high and we have dozens of those. So the mountains aren't as large, but the area is, I don't know how to describe it. It's different, very, very thick, very lush. They don't have the population density in, in, but in a few core metropolitan areas. So there's a lot of open regions that we just don't have here. Yeah. And how, how many people were uh, identified as part of that cluster there in British Columbia? So in that greater Vancouver area, you have over 30 people and there's three clusters really close into town, including a fourth one in the city of Vancouver. And as you start to go out, there's more even. So it's surprising to me. In fact, it was shocking to me. Did you find that there were people that were more likely to go missing in just completely open areas or uh, was it uh, just as likely that they'd go missing in open areas as they would in terms of populated areas? I think that uh, it's a little bit of both. Uh, I mean, I wrote an art. I wrote a story about uh, a guy that disappeared in the far north and the territories and it was a snow color covered area where he went hunting for caribou and they found his snowmobile really in the middle of nowhere. He took a backup snowmobile in case the first one went down and they, the locals that he lived with came out and searched and they found an area where he dug out under the snowmobile and he had a blanket down there and, and a foam padding where he slept. <laughs> but as far as you could see, it was dead flat. They never found him. He was completely gone. That's but where did he go? Yeah, exactly. Where did he go? Where can, where do these people go? Did you did you find that there was any difference in the the number of people who had gone missing that were found versus just never recovered in terms of, you know, looking at the 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 cases here in the states? I do think that the percentages of never found are higher in Canada. And I'm not sure why that's the case. Um but no, definitely a higher percentage. All right. And what about uh, signs of animal attacks? Uh, was it any more up there? Because I know that they have like bears and, and wolves a lot more so than they have down here in the United States. Yeah, they have they have many more deadly creatures up there than we do in the States. Uh, I mean, the grizzly bear only occupy a handful of states in the U.S., whereas in Canada, you got whole areas of the country that are filled with grizzly bears. So, no, it's... Uh, I didn't, I didn't run into a lot of predation cases and probably because I knew exactly what I was looking for. I'm getting a little better with the research. So I, I won't stumble around too much, but no, not too much predation in these. What uh, was the reaction from the people in these communities where you've got clusters of missing people or the family members of people who've gone missing? What, what do they think? It's a good question. Uh, We've got a policy that I don't reach out and proactively ask for opinions on cases unless that family reaches out to me. We were told early on in this research from missing persons groups, I asked them, I said, where are the landmines in this research? And what they said was, is if you're going to write stories about the missing people, then don't proactively go out and try to talk to and get information from the families or the victims because they will feel like feel as though they're being re-victimized again if you then go out and write a story. Yeah. So what I try to do is I, I try to glean all my information from official reports, archives, things like that. And then unless the people contact me, and if they do, then obviously I, I have a lengthy conversation. And there ha are a few of those cases in British Columbia. Would you be open to talking about any of those uh, people who reached out to you? 
Sure. There's there's a man that disappeared uh, just outside of Vancouver named Ray Salmon. And Ray was a hunter, and he went into an area near a lake, and he set up with his dogs in this campground area, very remote. And Ray was going to be there for a week, and he always took his dogs with him as a, a safety precaution. Well, on his third night in this campground, other people reported hearing gunfire. And I got to tell you, this is way, I mean, even though it's probably 40 miles from downtown Vancouver, it's light years away from, you, you can't drive there for a couple hours. It's, it's way out there in the middle of nowhere. Some other people heard gunfire. They called the RCMP. They come out and they don't see anything. And they see a camper there and there's dogs in the camper. Hmm. They start searching the area and they find a pile of clothes right near the lake. And the lake is maybe a couple hundred yards from Ray's truck. And they go, well, that's odd, you know, because it's pretty cold out. Well, the next day they bring in more RCMP and they start searching. And the unusual part now is that Ray's wife, who had called me, said, Dave, when I was there, the RCMP shows up with a SWAT team and they're going into the bush. They're going into the forest with the SWAT team. And they're not saying a lot to her. And they said after the third day of searching that they think he's in the lake. So Danielle, his wife, gets a special underwater team that can drag this device behind their boat and see everything that's in the water. Mm. And they dragged it for, well, they didn't drag it, but they pulled this thing and the, it's, the sonar showed everything for three days. And they said, we guarantee he's not in the water. So here's the question. First of all, he never left the truck without the dogs because the dogs provided safety against bears. Mm -hmm. The dogs were in the truck. His clothes are on the beach next to the lake. He's not in the lake. Why would the RCMP put a SWAT team into the woods? And we filed a Freedom of Information Act request, and so did Danielle, against the RCMP and the government to get all the reports. And they gave us a copy of one report, three pages long, that is 95% redacted. Mm. And they Ooh. told her that they, they told the victim's wife they can't release information on this. That's crazy. You know, my next question was gonna be, did you encounter any resistance when you were looking into any of these cases? What, did you have any other uh, opportunity to, to get resistance from the authorities while you were there? Well, I thought that was a pretty in-your-face moment. Yeah. And not that they wouldn't give me the information because I, I kind of understand that. But to not give it to a victim's wife, yeah, I think that's cold-blooded. I would have to say either that or they've got something that they really don't want people to know. Uh, I have never heard of a SWAT team being called into the woods like that or even into a, a remote wilderness area. That sounds so strange. Very strange. Uh, I think I've heard about it maybe a couple of times, uh, but they were always chasing, you know, a real bad guy. Mm. And there was no mention of somebody else in that camping area that they were looking for ever. Was there, so Ray was staying out there completely alone. It wasn't like a campground with other people in the vicinity. I mean, he was just out there on his own. There wasn't anybody who could have taken him from the campsite. I, I think there were people like within a mile radius, but nobody very close. Yeah, that's not very, that's not very close when you're thinking about camping. Uh, and his clothes were just left on the side of the lake. He is not, he was not in the lake. Were there any tracks? Was there anything that uh, that that canines were able to, to go after? No, and that's the another unusual part. Now, part of those profile points that I write about is missing, missing clothing and missing shoes, and that's pretty common. And people will say, oh, you know, it was hypothermia. Uh, no, because Ray could see his camper truck from the beach where his clothes were. So hypothermia didn't even come into play. Hmm. Like he just disappeared. Yeah. We've got a couple of different cases like that in this book, Dave. Uh, there was several 
cases that I wanted to talk about specifically. Let me just take a look at my notes here. Uh, there was a cluster of three in Manitoba, and I, I believe there was more than that, but I, I wanted to kind of jump around. Uh, Betty Wolfram, she went missing back in May of 1934. Uh, do you, do you, have you found that record keeping was better the further back you go uh, because there's no authorities to, to hide those cases, or uh, is it harder to do because they're so old? You know, the further you go back, it seems like the less restrictions they placed on their reporters for talking freely. Because in those 30, 1930, 40, and 1950 articles, you'd find things there that you won't find today. Yeah. And uh, I, I was actually pretty surprised at some of the articles that you were able to find. It, it did seem like people were more willing to talk about it, perhaps because they didn't quite understand what was going on. And there was really no other way to spread information. But Betty was another one of those cases that had missing clothing. Can you tell us about her? Sure. She was a four-year-old girl, May 15th, 1934, Moosehorn, Manitoba. It's a, it's a lonely, isolated city about 120 miles northwest of Winnipeg, and it's directly north of North Dakota. Uh, this community, predominantly farming, very flat. Uh, the family owned a small farm on the outskirts of Moosehorn, southwest of a small city called Spear Hill. Well, on uh, May 15, 1934, Carl Wolfram, a German, put sleeping Betty in a small carriage in the front yard of the farmhouse. And he went into the adjacent field to start seeding the ground for a new crop. Well, that region around the farm had a lot of swamps, large fields, dusty dirt roads, and again, it was dead flat. Well, on this date, Carl didn't see anyone driving on the roads, didn't hear anything, didn't see anything. And after a while, he went back to check on his daughter who was sleeping in the carriage. Well, he went back and the carriage was empty. And originally he thought maybe his wife or one of the farming helpers had taken his daughter. So he starts calling for people. They start searching the area. They can't find her. And they, this is really odd. So they call the RCMP. Well, Mrs. Wolfram was directly from Germany. Now, let me stop the story here. Because one of the things that I write about in my other books is there's a high propensity of people to disappear with German descent. And I can't explain it, but that's a fact that I've written about over and over again. And in, in fact, all of the physicists I've ever written about were all German, which is a very, very odd coincidence. Mm. So anyhow, Mrs. Wolfram was from Germany, had taught Betty only German. She, she didn't know English. Well, the RCMP farmers, the volunteers searched the region for four days and went out to, to a uh, distance of two to three miles. They called the girl's name, looked for tracks. They never received a response. And on one of those first days of the search, the skies opened up and it rained for hours. This is important because another profile point is I walk about, I talk about weather changes in conjunction with the search or the disappearance. Here's another one. On the fourth day, searchers believed they had covered every possible location that Betty could be in, and they essentially were given up. And on that fifth day at 2 p.m., a farmer from Spear Hill named Ray Rosen left his farmhouse to take a walk and found Betty calmly walking in a swamp area. She was semi-conscious, and she was calling for her dad. Roy picked her up and took her home. She was taken to a local physician for an examination. And here is the important part that you probably would never get nowadays, but it was in an article. And it, it's imperative that you understand the reason why it's important. And here's what it says. It says, this is to certify that today I examined Betty Wolfram. The history of the case is that the child has been lost 110 to 120 hours. Examination of the child reveals very little loss of flesh, no evidence of dehydration. Furthermore, in view of the fact that there have been so many mosquitoes present, it is significant that there are no bites or scratches present. In my opinion, this child has had food, water, and shelter for the past three to four days, as I do not believe that a child who has always been delicate 
could have withstood this long exposure and show so little trace. Now, Betty was found completely dry, even though it had rained heavily the previous night. Also, her clothes and shoes were relatively clean for being missing for four days. Now, her mom spoke to Betty in German, but Betty was terrified and whimpering and had hardly, and had hardly spoken anything since she had been home. Now, a side note, George Romain was another neighboring farmer, and he had reported several of his cows had returned from the field milked, a very odd coincidence during the time frame that Betty was missing. Now, the RCMP interviewed the farmer who found Betty, that was Roy. He admitted he went straight to the spot where the girl was found. He said he didn't expect to come back alive, or if he did come back, he'd be all broken up in his, in his words. You could tell by the style that the reporters were writing in that Roy knew a lot more than what he was saying, but wouldn't say exactly what he was encountering. The RCMP went to the spot where Betty was located many times and found nothing. Nothing was found as though something was living there. Nothing was found as though someone had lived there. Zero was located. There's no way someone could go into or out of this area of Moosehorn without people seeing the stranger. It's impossible because it's so flat and the roads were so obvious. Well, someone fed and gave water to Betty. It's obvious. She was terrified for some reason. She didn't know how to milk a cow, and she was too small. So if Betty hadn't and didn't have mosquito bites, she had to have been being sheltered, but where since no shelter was ever found? And what was the secret behind what Farmer Roy was harboring? This one just absolutely stunned me because it's so clear that Betty was taken care of by someone. Uh, there's there's no way a child uh, of that age is going to be able to survive in the condition that she did out in the middle of nowhere in Canada. And, and then you throw in the fact that there's obviously some knowledge of some type of danger. Uh, I just, this is the kind of thing where you wish you could go back and speak to these people directly. I bet this, uh, it's got to be frustrating sometimes. Oh, I, I think I'd have a million questions for what happened. And I don't know that if I would have been the RCMP on scene, I would have given these farmers such a easy pass on their story. Now, do I think that the farmers played any part in the disappearance? Absolutely not. I mean, these guys lived very close by. And I, I think in the end, if Betty got her wits about her later on and it was the farmer that took her, she would have said so and they would have arrested him. That's why I, you just know it wasn't him. Yeah. It was something really, really unusual that came into play here that obviously one of the farmers knew about because of his description of going in and thinking he wasn't coming out. Mm -hmm. But what was it? And going in, was he? he's referring to the swamp there? He had to have been. Yeah, yeah. And just by coincidence, when we talk about water, in many of the books I talk about, there's swamps and bogs are associated with these disappearances. And why is that? And I, and I think there's an, a pretty easy answer, is that most people won't walk into a swamp. That's right. They'll stay away from it. So if you're going to try to hide yourself from the general populace and it was a big swamp, put yourself right in the middle of it. That would be the place to go. It's, it's, uh, it's confounding to think <laughs> what could possibly be the reason behind something like this happening. Well, what did you think when you read it? I mean, thinking that she's out there in the middle of nowhere, she must have been sheltered, she must have been fed. Uh, I mean, I hesitate to say because I don't want to sound like a loon, but I, I, I mean, it, it's obviously not a farmer. It's obviously not a friend or a family member. Uh, it, and if somebody's milking the cows, I mean, that makes me think that there is a creature or a being or something out there uh, perhaps not fully existing in this uh, this dimension or something like that. Uh, you know, I mean, I know that there is so much out there in the world that, that we're not privy to. You know, we just don't have the knowledge. Uh, maybe there's things out there that we can't see. 
but I immediately think of some type of being that has the ability to hide itself, uh, that has the ability to, you know, go in between and, and slip through the veil, if you want to say. Um, it, it, it reminds me of the one case where the gentleman went missing in the desert and the woman was walking on the path and she heard him. She heard him calling for help but he was nowhere to be found. So how is his voice there on the trail? Uh, it, it makes me think that there is some place that these people are going that we as, you know, as regular people are unable to get to. Yeah, and I think that's a pretty logical way to look at it. The, the other case you were talking about was that one at a Mesa Verde National Park where yes. a reporter heard somebody calling for help she herself looked for the man, couldn't find him. And then second and third times they sent search teams in there. They they never did find the guy. Yeah, yeah. But he had to have been there. I mean, it's not like, you know, unless there was a, a speaker set up someplace. But I mean, I, I can't imagine that that's the case because they would have found the speaker. They would have found some method for him to be, you know, distance uh, dropping his voice in there. Uh, so the other thing that it made me think about, of course, is, uh, you know, tales of in interesting things happening with cattle and, uh, and, and UFOs. You know, I mean, the lights, uh, you know, around livestock, livestock coming up missing, uh, livestock uh, coming up with incisions, surgery, things removed. And that's something I've always thought about with these cases is that is there an extraterrestrial component to it? Um, but at the same time, it seems like maybe there's a, a like a, a Bigfoot component, you know, and and, uh, and but that blows my mind because are those two things related? Well, if they are, then it, it changes everything, really. <laughs> yeah. And there you go. People would be calling you a loon for saying that out loud. But yeah. I don't, I don't think that's so loony when you look at the DNA that we found in our study on Bigfoot. So, Whoa, can we talk about that? <laughs> we're glad to talk about it on another show. Okay, all right. I'll, I'll definitely be having you back to speak about that. That's incredible. Well, um, what, about, uh, what about Florence Spence? This wasn't long. What was it? Long, it was right after? Yes. It was, it was not long after a Betty went missing, just a couple months later. Yeah, it was a... That 1934 summer in Manitoba was really, really odd. So you had Betty Wolfram, who disappeared May 15th, 1934. Florence Spence, a three-year-old girl, disappears August 5th, 1934. So about three months afterwards. And then you have a boy named Frank Goy, who disappears two days after Florence Spence. He's seven years old, and he's in Dallas, Manitoba. He wandered away from his home, and he was seven years old, and he was eventually found 13 miles away. Now, this isn't like walking a road for 13 miles. This is like walking through the bush for 13 miles, and nobody walks in the bush a straight 13 miles. And a Les Stroud survivor man one time told me, he goes, yeah, if they're saying somebody walked 12 miles, they really walked about 18 miles. So under this scenario, a seven-year-old boy disappears and is found 13 miles away, meaning he walked 20. So Pretty this hard. is 13 miles as the crow flies, not as, you know, you're walking on a path. Exactly. Yeah. So Florence Spence, you, you have two two kids in two days. Spence was a First Nations child, meaning a, a native Canadian child. She was one of two kids that vanished in a 48-hour time span. Her family lived in a log cabin in, cabin in central Manitoba mining area. On August 5th, Mr. and Mrs. Spence took a day trip to visit what's called the Oro Grande Mine, three miles from their cabin, and they left their kids in their cabin. The parents returned in a few hours, and Florence was gone. The other kids said that they just saw her just a few minutes ago playing in the front yard. Everyone knew she couldn't go very far, so they all came out of the house, started searching and yelling for her. When she couldn't be found, the neighbors were called, and they called their friends, and they called their friends, and soon they had 100, 100 plus people looking for the girl, along with a local pilot named Roy Brown, and he was flying, looking down into the bush for the girl. Some searchers said that they saw large bear tracks near the family cabin, but saw no evidence of predation or an encounter. 
Now, on August 12th, seven days after she disappears, a local resident named Blair had a dream about finding Florence. And here's the quote from the article. He discovered her lying almost naked and semi-conscious between two rocks. As soon as he was able to arouse the child, she moaned, water. Blair immediately gave her a small drink from a nearby pool. He picked the girl up, carried her for 40 minutes until he got to the mining office of the local physician. Blair stated that where Florence was found had no easy way in or out, and he thought she was close to three miles away. The night before Florence was found, coyotes and wolves were heard yelping in that area. The day she was found, the headlines in the paper were, quoting, searchers abandon all hope of finding child missing for five days. Many believe that Florence had been consumed by a bear. Now, this is just one of about a dozen stories I've written over the years about somebody unrelated to them, unrelated to the victim, that has a dream, and somehow that person is summoned to where the victim is located. That one really got to me <laughs> because it it throws in just a another level of supernatural to this whole thing. Uh, you know, how how can you explain someone having a dream about someone that they're not even acquainted with, not related to, and then they are led to an area that they should not be? Uh, it's almost like he was drawn there in order to find her before she died. You know, I've. I've, heard, I've gotten a lot of feedback on these stories that I've written. And the common wording that I get back from people is that person was summoned. Mm. And it's, it's really hard not, not to agree with that because yeah. how would you in it? You know, it's like a billion to one shot, three, three miles away in the middle of the bush. And you just walk to the exact area between two rocks and you just happen to find this girl. I don't think so. I don't no. think the luck plays into this. No, it, it definitely feels like there is some level of intervention going on here. Uh, it uh, I just I, I can't I can't imagine any other way that this is happening. I mean, there's some type of intelligence in my mind behind what's happening, how these people are disappeared uh, and uh, also in how they're returned, um, because they're they're certainly not going missing by any normal or natural method or means. What well, also tells me that whatever happened to Florence, she was meant to come back to her parents. Yeah, she wasn't meant to die. Now, you you mentioned that uh, she was she was a First Nations child, so she was uh, Native American or Native Canadian, I guess. Um, was there very many cases of uh, of people from Native Canadian tribes that uh, that went missing, or did uh, was was this an isolated case among many? This was a pretty much an isolated case among many. Uh, one of my best friends is a Cheyenne Arapaho Native American chief. His name is Harvey Pratt. And Harvey was the number two person in the, at the Oklahoma Bureau of Investigation for years. One of the smartest men I know and one of the most polite people you'll ever meet. But anyhow, Harvey and I had, had have had talks about this. And he said, Dave, when I was a small child living on the reservation, we'd go away for weekends and we'd sit around the campfire and we were always told never to walk away from the fire. Never get out of sight of that fire. And he said that they were always told that, that there were bad spirits out there and they would take you. And he said at the time, I always told them as I got older, ah, you know, they're just trying to scare us so we wouldn't get lost and this and that. And he goes, yeah, you know, looking back on it. And as many cases of, as you've written about this kind of stuff, maybe there really was something to it that, the, these stories generated from. Yeah, I, I, I've thought about that too, uh, how interesting it is that, I mean, I've heard the same types of stories. Uh, something called a Wendigo, I think I've heard of before, that was specifically like a man-eating um, spirit that would just grab people up off the trail and, and take them away. Uh, and, I, you know, it, it's, it's, um, I'm not surprised to hear that there's not very many missing native people because this type of thing does get passed along and, and they tend to be a lot more 
connected and in tune with the land and with their surroundings. Uh, you know, I would think quite, uh, uh, you know, it's quite strange that, that the most people that go missing or that the largest percentage of a single uh, you know, type of person being German going missing, uh, it, that seems to have something to do with their specific level of intellect. I mean, you know, physicists are a rather select group. Uh, German physicists are an even more select group. And for them to all go missing in this type of manner, that's an even weirder coincidence. And I just, there are no coincidences in that case, I think. Well, getting back to the native Canadian people, there is right now a huge investigation going on in Northern British Columbia. It's called the Highway of Tears case. And many people have probably heard of it, but it's yeah. a series of Native American women who have disappeared along this highway in central Northern British Columbia. And it's been going on for decades. And the RCMP has a task force that's been working this for many, many years. And they, they've never arrested anybody, but it all points that it's a serial killer that's targeting these women along this highway. Mm -hmm. And then uh, there's also been uh, a new investigation that started recently about the disappearance of Native American or Native Canadian children. And that's really been held pretty close to the vest, and there's not a lot of publicity about it. So I, I can't speak directly to that. But that the Native American women that are missing along that highway of tears, there's a lot of publicity about it, and hopefully someday they'll catch somebody. Yeah, I, I've, I've actually heard about that case for, or, you know, that, that cluster of cases for a long time. And it always struck me as, um, you know, not too surprising if somebody wants to, and, you know, if somebody wants to be a serial killer, uh, that seems like a pretty good place to go just based upon the remoteness of it. You know, how much land is up there? Uh, if people are hitchhiking along a desolate highway, then it seems like easy pickings, unfortunately. Yeah, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah. Well, what about uh, Jack Pike? Jack Pike was another one in this Manitoba cluster, and it, you know, about a year after uh, Frank and Francis. Yeah, uh, September 5th, 1935, Jack was five years old from an area called St. Norbert. Well, the family took a berry picking trip to St. Vital. And it's in the southern part of Winnipeg, and they went to go get blueberries. Now, in Missing 411 Eastern U.S., I wrote about an entire series of berry pickers that disappeared. Mm. So this is a subgroup of people that actually have shown to disappear doing a specific uh, practice in the woods. The family exited their car, and Jack took off running through the berry patch, and he quickly got out of sight. And Mrs. Pike told the news that her boy was missing just a few minutes when she heard a scream, quoting, as if he was terrified, the scream s seemed to be choked off in the middle. The Pikes ran 100 yards toward the scream and found nothing. Uh, and people who read my books always like to know the religious affiliation to the story. And when I can give it, I do give it. Well, this family was on a religious site, and it was the Trappist Monks Monastery near the Red River in southern uh, Winnipeg. Now, once the Pikes couldn't locate the boy, they called the police. There's a massive search of police officers, search and rescue personnel. Over 2,000 of the locals came. The banks of the Red River were searched, bushes, everything was combed, like relentlessly. On the fourth day, a man found Jack under a bush on the opposite side of the Red River. The boy was unconscious but alive. He was rushed to the hospital where he was given stimulants, and the father gave him a pint of blood. At one point, Jack awoke and said, hi, Daddy, and then quickly faded off and died a few hours later. Police and searchers were stunned about how Jack could have gotten on the opposite riverbank because he wasn't wet or muddy. The police stated that they could not find any evidence of an abduction or kidnapping, and they stated that he either died of exposure or dehydration. But here's what everyone I, I need to people need to think about is you have 2,000 searchers in this area for four days. How could this boy get in and out of that area and then be under a bush, not wet, on the opposite bank of a river? And obviously something happened to him that caused him to scream. 
kids just don't scream on their own unless they're scared of something. So what happened to Jack Pike? What I was really wondering is if there was any types of marks on his body. I mean, a child stop being stopped from screaming, it, it, it elicited the idea in my head of someone grabbing him around the neck, maybe, you know, uh, covering his face, but there was no reports of anything like that? Nothing. Which is suspicious, I, I, I will grant you. So maybe there was some editorializing going on on this story, and maybe the police didn't give everything that they knew. But it it is an odd, odd case because the berry picking part of it really struck me when I read it. And the water affiliation again. Yeah, the, the water was one of the things that stood out to me. I did not know that there was a subset of berry pickers. That's incredibly strange. Uh, but what... What what really fascinated me with it was that you, it's almost like you know the exact moment at which he went missing because of that scream. Absolutely. Yeah. And imagine if you were the parents and you heard that and you find your boy four days later and he regains consciousness for a few minutes and then dies. Uh, that, that would just – I'd be horribly upset for the rest of my life. Yeah, that would be super painful. As a father myself, I yeah, that that's another reason that I picked that one because it would be horrific, horrific. Well, uh, how about uh, Geraldine Huggin? This is uh, moving on now to Ontario. Okay, so uh, this is in 1953, July 5th, six miles west of Minaki, M-I-N-A-K-I, five years old. The Huggins left their home in Winnipeg for a six-week summer vacation They brought their three daughters to Wade, W-A-D-E. It's a small city, and there was a cottage belonging to the grandparents. The region is really swampy, with the Canadian Railroad passing near the cabin. On July 5th, 1953, the family was gathering in the front yard of the cabin to make a trip to a local lake. Now, Geraldine was on the side yard, and her two sisters were in the front yard. She was out of sight for about 10 minutes and vanished. The Huggins searched the area around the cabin, yelled for their daughter. Girls all were looking. Nobody saw anything. Nobody heard anything. And Geraldine never responded to the calls. Now, if you stop there for a second, in heavy bush like this, how far can a little five-year-old get? And I don't think in that amount of time that she could get out of yelling sight. Mm -hmm. So if you're in the bush and you're upset and you're lost and you hear your parents, what are you going to do? Probably run to them, run call to out for them. Or yell back, right? Yeah. Well, they don't hear. They don't hear anything. So uh, they they call the RCMP. One officer from Minaki arrived, and immediately called for the First Nations tracking team to assist. A very smart move. And the First Nations tracking team was a group of Native Canadians that were just like the absolute experts at tracking anybody through anything. And just as the search was getting started, heavy rains inundated the area, and a call was made now for the Army to assist and respond from Winnipeg. Mr. Huggins told the searchers that his daughter would never wander and would just sit down and cry. But the story wasn't adding up because they kept searching outer and outer areas from the cabin and weren't finding anything and weren't finding any tracks. On the third day, trackers found what they believed to be Geraldine's tracks high on a ledge near an area called Fox Lake. There were now 200 people looking in this area with an RCMP plane and volunteers. The search continued now on to seven days, and they still had found nothing to point specifically to the young girl. At this point, a prospector named Harry Hawes joins the search effort. He had found two other boys in the past, and he said the girl would be found near Long Lake, but he never said why. Now going into the ninth day of the search, the First Nation trackers were not giving up and they found a small, small piece of cloth on a bush that they believed was Geraldine's. And they took it to her parents and they confirmed that it was. So now they're getting closer. But the girl was a long ways away and apparently still moving after nine days, which made no sense. Mm. Day 10, searchers were on the far side of Long Lake near the railroad tracks, 
and found what they thought was Geraldine's remains. Now, B, you got to real listen carefully to, to the wording on some of this. They found her plaid shirt and blue jeans. They found in the, the ground in the area heavily matted down as though something that weighed significantly had been through the area. One of the legs on the blue jeans was inside out, and Tracker stated that the location was near a place called Catastrophe Lake. They also stated that there was not enough remains left for a proper burial or inquest. Uh, the police stated that there was no blood on the clothing, meaning it had been removed before consumption. There were wolf tracks in the area, but the native trackers stated that they came post-death, meaning Geraldine had died, whatever killed her was gone, and the wolves came in and cleaned up the remains. They made it clear that the wolves did not kill the girl. Now, there was some controversy because the trackers found what they believed to be a large human track in the moss on their seventh day but no other like tracks like this were found post seventh day. Searchers didn't even find the bones of the remains of Geraldine. That's how little was left. Now here's the question. Why would Harry Hawes know where Geraldine would be located? Mm. And there were similarities with this case with two other cases I've written about in the past. One was in this book here, and that was the Bart Schleyer death in Yukon and the Jared Adadero death in Colorado. And what was familiar, similar with those is clothing was found of those two victims and their clothes were found inside out. In Schleyer's death, the press said that a bear had killed him. I personally talked to the resource officer that did the investigation. He said it was a blatant lie. He says it was the strangest case he's ever taken on in his career. But he goes, a bear did not cure old Bart Schleyer. And then in the Adadero case, the sheriff said, oh, he was killed by a mountain lion. And four different mountain lion experts were interviewed by Mr. Adadero, the father of Jared. And they specifically said, we guarantee a mountain lion didn't kill Jared. Now, in Geraldine's case, what took her and what killed her? <clears throat> what really creeps me about, out about this one is that they th you, it's, you say they thought they found her remains, but but there's no blood, there's no bones. Uh, what happened to her blood? There is there's no creature or animal that I know of that removes all the blood from its victim prior to consuming its its body uh, and uh, and discarding of all of the evidence. Uh, and then you've got the large footprint. Uh, and the matting down of the area, which both of those things uh, seem to indicate a large hominid, somebody of you know big stature, uh, and then you've got the, uh, the the it's the the animal the animals coming around to eat it, but then there's like nothing there to even indicate that there was an animal attack. It's just again a baffling case. What do you think about that one? So. Maybe it was the way I worded this. There was no blood on the clothing, but there was never anything said about there wasn't blood in the area. Oh, okay, okay. But the, the significant part to me was wild animals do not remove your clothing before they consume you. Yeah, exactly. It, say a grizzly bear is going to attack you. They're going to eat your clothes. They're going to eat everything in you. And then what they'll find is they'll find your clothes and the bear scat. Mm -hmm. Now, in this incident... The native trackers, I think, knew a lot more what was, about what was going on and didn't say it. Mm -hmm. And that's unfortunate. Or maybe they did say it and the RCMP filtered it and edited it and wouldn't let it out. I don't know. But I think that it's, it's very, very odd that in those three cases that I cited, the clothing was off. There was no blood on the clothing. The pants were inside out. So what's at play here? What could be removing clothing from people unless that it had hands? Exactly. <laughs> hands, hands, a hominid. <sighs> uh, have you ever thought about trying to specifically interview uh, First Nations peoples about these types of disappearances to see if it, maybe they have any information that, that no one's asked them about? 
So I'm specifically going to British Columbia the day after Christmas for a week. And I've got a whole series of interviews lined up with those exact people. Oh, wow. I'm really looking forward to hearing what you get back from that. Is is that going to be for a, another film project or is that for a separate uh, book project? It's, it's sort of just uh, informational gathering right now and see where it goes. Okay. Well, like I said, very interested to hear about that. Um, what about uh, the case of Jessica Azopardi? This was in 1985, so a little bit more recent. And you know, I'm interested to, to see how the evidence stacks up between these cases that are you know, 50 and 60 years apart. So Jessica was only 20 months old, so she was just barely walking July 24th in Elmstead, Ontario. And it occurred on the banks of Lake St. Clair. And that is two miles east of Windsor, Ontario, and that's two miles from the U.S. border in Detroit. Mm -hmm. And this lake kind of forms the border of these areas. And the mother, grandmother, and little Jessica were at their house at the lake. And the kids were on the side yard picking onions. Well, Mrs. As a Party started to look for Jessica, couldn't find her. But then as she looked towards the lake, she, which is obviously water again, Jessica, she found the Jessica's diaper sitting about 50 feet from the lake. Now, everyone in the family knew that Jessica would never go near water, and she was afraid of it. Hmm. Well, a neighbor was across the street mowing the lawn and stated that nobody had driven down the street, and he hadn't seen or heard anyone in the area. Well, it was at this point that the family decides to call the RCMP. The U.S. Coast Guard responds, along with helicopters from Canada and the U.S., and it Boats from both jurisdictions were converging on the home. And within an hour, the RCMP started to believe that Jessica had been abducted because there was no evidence where she was located. So at 7.30 a.m. the following morning, Jessica's body is found floating six miles from her residence. So the RCMP immediately put out a statement that her body could not have floated to this location in the 16 hours based on the currents. An autopsy was done and stated that Jessica had died 90 minutes before she was found. Now, where, where was she for 14 and a half hours? They listed the cause of death as drowning. Now, please don't let any listener believe that someone dropped her body in the lake at 6 a.m. with dozens of police, Coast Guard, and RCMP combing the area for the body. That would be completely insane. Yeah. But how did she get there? Now, I wrote a book. It was the fourth book I ever wrote about this called Missing 411, A Sobering Coincidence. And in that book, I highlighted a series of young men who disappeared in many times a college atmosphere, at a dance, at a bar, sometimes at an athletic event. And they disappeared right in amongst other people. And then they were found days later deceased in a river, pond, lake, and there was never, never a good explanation how they got there. There were never any witnesses. Nobody ever saw them leave the location. Nobody ever saw them get in the water. Now, what happened with that was is that a lot of these cases came out of Wisconsin, and some of these families were pretty well-to-do, and when the autopsy came back that the person drowned, in a few of these cases, the parents said, I don't care if my son was even 100% drunk and you put him in a water, he swims like a fish. He's going to save himself. Even if it's frozen, you're going to be able to swim some amount. So they didn't believe the, the determination on the cause of death. So what they did was is they called for a second autopsy and they paid for it. In, the sec in most autopsies, each jurisdiction is restricted just by dollars and cents about how many different things they can screen your blood and urine for. And there's usually a list of 24 different drugs, narcotics, and things. But one thing that they weren't screening for was something called GHB, which was known to you and me as a date rape drug. Now, in two of the autopsies where the parents called for a second autopsy, they found extraordinary levels of GHB hmm. in their son's blood. And nobody could figure out how it got in there. Now, when I was a policeman, I knew a little bit about this. And GHB will allow you to stay awake. 
and you know what's happening to you, but you can't do anything about it. It's like you're paralyzed. Isn't it? Is it considered a hypnotic? Not really hypnotics. It's more of a paralysis like drug. Okay. You can't respond. Yeah. But you're cognizant of what's going on. So if I take you in the in those conditions and I put you in a body of water, you're going to die of drowning. Mm -hmm. And every time I hear about a death in water where it's drowning under weird circumstances, I always think of this because I can almost guarantee in Jessica's case, they never check for GHB. Was was GHB was that? I mean, isn't that a relatively new drug? Was that available back in 1985? Well, now here's the word weird twist. Our body produces minute levels of GHB. Hmm. When I wrote the book, A Sobering Coincidence, right after that, I got a series of emails from coroners, medical examiners, physicians, saying, "Dave, we've had these same sort of cases in our jurisdiction." And we couldn't figure out what was happening. But now you, you kind of gave us the key here. We'll start looking at GHB again. We never looked at it. And we were only searching for 24 drugs. And then after I started talking on shows about this, what if there was a way to cause our body to produce GHB at these extraordinary levels? Oh, wow. And I'm just, I was thinking outside the box. And then I had a couple of physicians and researchers call me and say, Dave, that's a phenomenal idea. Why couldn't that happen if we just understood why? Mm -hmm. So the men, the boys, and these other people that have had been found with phenomenal levels of GHB, there, have, there was never an explanation how it got into their system. Now, in Jessica's case, there's a million questions. How did her body get in that lake, number one? Where was the body for 14 and a half hours? And then what were what was the condition of the body? Because they never released that. Were there any marks? Was there mm. was there anything that we should know? And then one of the big things that I'm always interested in is that when somebody's gone for 14 and a half hours, if you haven't eaten anything, your stomach should be about empty. Yeah. What were those stomach contents? But none of that information was available? No. That is very scary. I mean, the, the fact that there were so many people around and uh, with the location of where the body was found, if she was with someone, then it seems that it would have been pretty obvious that they had placed her there. Uh, just don't even know what to think. That's a great idea, though. If, <laughs> if there is a physiological production of GHB in your body, if someone could induce the production uh, in order to kidnap you that would make it really easy to do oh yeah and uh most people didn't know that the body does produce it in minute levels but it, it's very strange no i had never heard of that i had never heard of that well dave we've got just one more case that i wanted to ask you about uh emil irazola did i say that correctly I think that's pretty close. Okay, okay. And he was from Montreal. This is going way back again, back to 1927. Four-year-old boy, May 25th. It was Emile and his brother, Francois, and his aunt, Lucien. They went for a walk around downtown Montreal on the afternoon of May 25th. Well, as they're out on this walk, there's a massive rainstorm. And the aunt and the boys didn't come back to their home when the parents thought they were supposed to be there. And the police were called and a missing person report was filed. Now, the following morning, May 26th, Lucien and Francois were calling the police for help as they were lost and disoriented. Lucien stated that she had lost her memory, didn't know what had happened. She didn't know what they did, where they had been all night, and had no idea where Emile might be. Francois was interviewed by detectives, and that he remembered cr thinking he remembered crossing a deep creek and losing his brother in the water. Police said the story wasn't making any sense for anyone. So 100 police officers were assembled and started to search the part of the city where they found Lucienne. And they started searching parks, parking lots, everything. 
Well, the police did find Emil's pants turned inside out and torn to shreds. Several ponds in the area where they found the pants parts uh, pants were emptied in an attempt to locate the boy. On the second day of the search, the police found Emil in a field. He was wearing just one stocking. The coroner stated he'd been dead for two to three days. Now, what's interesting is that the police noted that there were no tracks leading to the body in the mud, and the police couldn't determine how he arrived at that location. If the boy had just stood up at the point he was found, he would have seen one of the busiest streets in the city of Montreal. The coroner stated it was accidental death, but no cause of death. He was missing for a total of four days. A few questions. How did Emil get into the field? Why aren't there any tracks? Why did the ant lose her memory? There was that big weather event. Emil was missing clothes, and there was an unknown cause of death. This is a case, even though I write mostly about incidents that happen deep in the wilderness, this was a case that happened right in the middle of a city that fit the criteria to a T. And I think it was worth mentioning because there's so many of those profile points that came into play. Yeah. I, I thought it was kind of a perfect storm of all those profile points. Uh, just incredible. Now, what really, uh, you know, made me think is is his, uh, his, his aunt having a lack of memory, having her, her own memory loss. Have you seen that in any other cases, other people that are associated with these missing people that also have memory loss or anything like that? Many, many of the people who go missing that I've written about that are later found alive have no memory about how they went missing, where they were when they were missing, or how they were found. But did they have people associated with their disappearances who also uh, had memory loss? No. No. Okay, so this is unique. Well, very interesting. Very well, interesting. It, may, it might have been unique, but I consider Lucien one of the victims here. Okay, all right. So I, I think she was... I think all three were at play in this disappearance because they were all missing for a while. Okay. Yes, I guess you're right. Yeah. I was uh, I was just thinking about the fact that Emil was the one listed there, so I didn't know if uh, the other two were necessarily part of that. Uh, and the fact that it, they went missing in the middle of a, t a city, uh, that once again you've got what appears to be the person just dropped wherever they're found with no obvious method of them walking there or you know falling there running anything like that uh, it's it's like they're just being deposited there that's what I think when I, I, I see them being dropped out of the sky it, it's tough to come up with some other scenario that fits yeah I mean especially next to a, a real busy street, uh, you you could kind of think, okay, well, maybe somebody was flying in a helicopter in 1927 and hovered and dropped right next to a busy city street and nobody on the street saw any. Yeah. It, none of the scenarios make a lot of good sense, but it's very difficult when there's police specifically made a note that there were no tracks around the body. Well, Dave, in writing this book about uh, these Canadian uh, cases, was there any – one thing that you discovered uh, during the course of this research that surprised you over and above what you've seen in other places? Well, I, I do think that this British Columbia scenario, it, that struck me hard. And this is the first book I've ever written where we included a full-size 24 by 36 inch map. Which I really appreciated. Thank you. Now, did that help you understand the areas where the people went missing. Yes, definitely. You know, I mean, like oftentimes when I've seen people, uh, you know, present your work uh, or I've seen, uh, you know, the these people clustered up, uh, you know, in the United States, uh, it's one thing. But like the area of Canada is far larger than the United States. There's a, a, a lot of spots up there that people could go missing. So I really appreciated having these clusters to look at because it, it, I, I know where the United States are. But I don't necessarily, you, you say, you know, British Columbia, you say Manitoba, uh, you know, these names, I, I don't 
immediately know where they are geographically. I'd have to look at a map, and having the map really helped. And that's the why. That's the reason why I included it with this book is because for me, visually seeing it and then associating the other disappearances in proximity, it helps me understand how serious these disappearances are. And I mean, just the how odd is it? That in 1934 in Manitoba, we have three kids who disappear in three months. Right. right. I mean, I think that's extraordinarily strange. And trust me, I, I scoured archives looking for anything similar to that in the previous 50 or post 50 years. Nothing comes close to that. And the same thing in British Columbia, where we have these small kids and even adults disappearing on a mountaintop eight miles outside of Vancouver and there's six people missing on one mountaintop that's only 4,000 feet tall, it makes no sense at all. What about the authorities? Was there anything to indicate that anyone had ever made the connection that there could be some connection between any of these missing persons cases? So British Columbia, their coroner's office has an online site of unidentified missing bodies. Hmm. But I don't think anyone has ever put together the names of the people who are missing and put pen to print like in a map so you can look at it and see, oh, wow, there's a lot of people missing that close to Vancouver. (laughs) Well, it's a good thing you came along. (laughs) Uh, It'll be interesting to hear some of the uh, feedback from from the locals. I mean, the other day I was on Coast to Coast and uh, it was... There were some people who did call in, one person specifically from Vancouver, and said, uh, no, Dave's right. There's a lot of people missing from the city, and nobody really wants to talk about it. Wow. Uh, what do you think that's about? Do you think that's a matter of pride? Do you think that's a matter of secrecy? That's a good question. I, I, I think that government officials don't like to publicly talk about anything that they can't give a reasonable answer about. I think it makes them feel inadequate and uncomfortable. So the best way in their mind, ignore it and walk away from it and don't even talk about it. Maybe ridicule it if you have to. Sure, I think that'd be an excellent way. Yeah, I see it happen all the time. (laughs) Yeah. All right, Dave. Well, can you think of anything that, uh, that that you wanted to talk about briefly as far as this book is concerned? I highly suggest you guys go to canammissing.com. I'm sorry, wait. Yes, I almost said Can Am Missing Project. Canammissing.com. Get yourself a copy. It's not available on Amazon. It's only available through Dave. Uh, you can get all of his books there, but just a fascinating read. You know, the last thing I would say is that uh, our movie – Missing 411, The Hunted, it's still out there, available on Amazon and iTunes, super highly rated. And I have got very few negative things that have come back to me about that movie. And uh, the director, Mike DeGrazier, did a great job on it. And in there, there's a segment that we talk about safety in the woods. And I really wish that everyone would see that segment and apply it to their hiking and backpacking endeavors because... If people practice this type of safety, I think disappearances would be reduced about 90%. I would uh, highly suggest you take Dave's advice. I'm a a member of REI, so I'm beginning one of those myself, the tracking devices. That's good. Yeah, yeah. All right, Dave. Well, thank you so much once again for coming on. I really appreciate it. I wish you much success with the book. And uh, Let's schedule a time for you to come back and talk about uh, uh, North American hominids, Bigfoots. Oh, boy, that'll be fun. Uh, right. Glad to do it. Always always happy to be on your show. Thanks for the invite. All right, thanks. We'll talk to you soon. Thank you.